All right, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Christine Rhodes. Chris Rhodes is an enrolled member of the Band River Band of uh, Lake Superior Chippewa and descendant of Fond du Lac Chippewa. She's earned a Master of Public Health in Public a Master of Public Health in Public Health Administration and Policy and a Bachelor of Science in Community Health Education, both from the University of Minnesota. <clears throat> For more than two decades, her professional work has focused on improving the health of American Indian communities, always with a community-led focus. She has developed tribal and urban health programs, resources with a strong focus on evaluation and research in order to develop an evidence base for what works in Native communities. She is currently the CEO of the American Indian Cancer Foundation, which is a national organization dedicated to eliminating cancer burdens for American Indians. In this role, she has developed this organization from the ground up to develop the necessary capacity to address a broad spectrum of cancer issues among tribal communities. Please, uh, let's welcome Chris to the stage. Good morning. Buju, Anin, Chi Ikwe, Indigenikas, Makwa Dudeum. Yesterday I had a conversation with an elder, oh, I see her right now, and she reminded me that we really need to be introducing ourselves in our language, and so thanks for that reminder. <laughs> um, I am really excited to be here today. It's been a tremendous conference so far, and um, I want to share a little bit about um, um, why I do the work that I do, and it really is about um, how cancer has impacted my family and how cancer screening, I believe, has already saved my life. I, um, as a young woman, um, cervical cancer screening, I had um, some abnormal results that required um, several treatments, and um, had I not had those regular screenings and the health care at my tribal health care system following me through that, um, I, um, that could have, from the stories I hear every day at the American Indian Cancer Foundation, I know that what the results could have been. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, one of the things we're doing is really promoting colorectal cancer screening. One of colorectal cancer is one of, colorectal cancer screening is a way to prevent colorectal cancer. And I think that's news to some people. Um, we found that African American and American Indian populations actually get cancer, colorectal cancer at younger ages. And um, now, actually this spring, there's been new media that this is uh, true of all populations, that we're seeing colorectal cancer presenting at younger ages. Well, our foundation has really been promoting um, screening starting at age 45. We've influenced um, the Institute for Clinical Systems Improvement to get healthcare providers to start colorectal cancer screening among American Indians and African Americans at age 45. So when I was 45, he said, are you going to go get screened? And I was like, oh, I don't know. And then um, 46 rolled around and I said, well, I better, better go do this. And um, so at 46, they um, found two polyps and um, one of them um, could have turned into cancer. And so again, if I would have waited until that 50-year-old guideline, you know, or 50-year-old screening where the guidelines traditionally say we should start, that would have been another four years. And I don't know what that, um, what that nasty little polyp would have turned into by then. So um, this um, work is really personal. And um, I know many of you have also had experiences um, with cancer in your own lives and in your families. So with that, I'm going to start. Um, we saw um, recently, I don't know if anybody's seen, there's a recent report to the nation on cancer rates um, and saying, you know, celebrating the good news that from 2000 to 2014, cancer death rates have declined for men, women, and children. And um, we've seen this across most populations. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case for American Indian people. We're not celebrating. 
In fact, cancer death rates for American Indians over the last 20 years um, have increased while they've um, decreased for other populations. Um, so the American Indian Cancer Foundation um, was formed by a number of tribal leaders um, that said not enough resources are being dedicated to this issue. Cancer is too silent in our tribal communities and we need to do something about it. We need to lead the way. Um, this was in 2011, so six, six years ago. And um, we're based in Minnesota, Minneapolis, and um, we work with tribes throughout the country to really, um, with this big mission, to eliminate cancer burdens. And we're looking um, all across the spectrum everything from prevention, early detection, treatment, and survivor support. We have a really strong focus in public health and um, in research that is community-driven. Um, these next few slides, um, including the, the chart that shows the, um, that the death rates are increasing for cancer in American Indians, um, are all from a um, publication that you can get on our website, and it's all the result of a publication. I'm going to give the citation in the next slide, I believe. Um, so I really just want to give you an overview here. Cancer is the number one cause of death for uh, American Indian women. Um, number two is heart disease. Number three is unintentional injury. Um, for, for American Indian men, um, heart disease is number one, cancer is number two, and unintentional injury is number three. These are national um, figures. And then another common question we get are what are the most common diagno commonly diagnosed cancers in our people? And for women, it's breast, lung, and colorectal. For men, it's prostate, lung, and colorectal. Um, but we really need to point out that lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death for men and women. Um, both American Indians and every other population, lung cancer accounts for um, most of the cancer mortality. Um, other leading causes of cancer death include prostate, colorectal, and breast. Um, but again, looking at that national data, we have to recognize that there are distinct patterns in native cancer data in everything. When I'm talking to a room full of researchers, we know the importance of our local data. Um, when we look at those national figures, they really don't tell us much because it's all so much lumped together. Um, so I'm going to go through, take you on a little tour throughout Indian country um, with a little data smudge. Um, so again, these results, this data is all from a publication um, that was um, published, published in the American Journal of Public Health in 2014. There was a special issue on um, American Indian mortality. And um, uh, so we, when working with tribal communities, we couldn't just bring out this scientific journal and say, here, this is the information, this is what we want you to know, because most people you know, they don't care about our publications. <laughs> and so um, we um, engaged our amazing graphic design team and, um, of, and came up with this document that's, a, and I think there are some at our booth. Um, checked out the exhibits down the hall. You can get a copy of these or you can um, go on our website and get a copy. So um, rightfully so, we're gonna start our tour in Indian country in the Northern Plains. Um, and what I want you to know is that in the Northern Plains, some of the highest cancer um, incidents and mortality rates um, for the United States and even in the world. Um, they're um, I've shared the most common, again, the cancer um, diagnoses on the left there, and then the deaths um, there. And when there's a little star next to it, it means that there is um, higher rates for American Indians than non-Hispanic whites. Um, the cancer disparities for American Indians versus whites in the North Northern Plains, some that stick out as more than double include liver cancer, larynx cancer for men, um, and among women we see cervical cancer rates that are more than four times that of white women in the same region, um, and gallbladder, gallbladder cancer rates that are more than three times. Uh, if we continue, we move east, we see um, we need to know that the 
tribes in the east, um, along that east coast in that huge region have lower cancer diagnosis rates for the top three cancers compared to both whites and other regions in general doing um, better. And, um, but there are some inequities for American Indian women in this region, being colorectal cancer, kidney cancer diagnosis, and liver cancer diagnosis. Um, Southern Plains, we see um, higher cancer diagnosis and death rates for the top three cancer in comparison to whites. And some inequities when it comes to um, stomach cancer diagnosis, liver cancer diagnosis, and liver cancer death for men and women. Um, and when we go to the Southwest, we see that the Southwest American Indian have lower cancer diagnosis and death rates for many of the most common cancers in comparison to whites. But again, there are some particular areas that we need to um, stay focused on, and those are um, stomach cancer diagnoses are higher um, for both men and women, um, as well as stomach cancer death and liver cancer diagnosis. If we tra keep traveling around and we go to the Pacific Coast, we also see this is an area where there are fewer cancer disparities than in other regions of Indian country. Um, we show similar or worse rates for some of the top cancers when compared to whites, um, but we do see some disparities for American Indian men and women in liver cancer diagnosis, liver cancer death, and stomach cancer diagnosis. Kind of hearing a theme going across. Um, in Alaska, um, Alaska has higher cancer diagnosis and death rates for many cancers compared to whites, and there are some tremendous inequities in comparison to um, between Alaska Natives and non-Hispanic white people living in that region um, when, in regards especially to stomach cancer. Um, and just a decade or so ago, this was true of colorectal cancer. Um, Alaska, the Alaska Native Health um, have done t tremendous work when it comes to colorectal cancer screening, and really um, they have some of the highest screening rates in the world, which is really incredible considering in Alaska, you have to, you can't, you don't have to just go down the road, and you don't have to just do your prep and go down the road, you actually have to probably get on a snow machine, a plane, what else, maybe? a boat, um, and so depending on the time of the year, and it's quite thick. So to imagine that in Indian country, the region that has the best colorectal cancer screening rates is the place where it's the hardest, <laughs> it means that we can, we can all do this. <laughs> Um, this, was also, this also recently came out of NCI, um, um, really celebrating the advances that we've seen in cancer. Um, so cancer prevention interventions available today there's a lot of great things that have happened. We have seven new drugs and three vaccines that are proven to reduce the risk for cancer that are all relatively new. Um, treatments for five infections that are known to increase cancer risk and proven cancer screening tests for a number of the most common cancers. And we know information, um, definitive information, about how our behavioral choices can impact our cancer risk. So I want to share a little bit about how we've been putting this information to work and really doing the translation across Indian country to develop some tools and resources for the people that do the frontline work, the healthcare providers, um, the survivors in the community that want to share information with their um, nieces and grandkids and making sure that they have the right information so that they don't have to experience cancer, a cancer diagnosis. So, again, we have this new tool, HPV vaccine. Um, it's most effective with preteen boys and girls. I think when it first came out, it, well, I know when it first came out, it was targeted for girls only. And um, it was really, there, it has gotten a lot of flack because people have tied it to sexual activity because HPV is sexually transmitted. And, um, some research that we've done at the American Indian Cancer Foundation with American Indian parents has been, this is cancer prevention, and then they're like, well, what, why, why are we even talking about sexual activity? Because this is about later life sexual activity. If you think your child might ever have sex in their lifetime, <laughs> 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 
maybe, um, you probably want to get this vaccine when they're <laughs> preteen, before they have sex. Um, and, and we really, really need to reframe it and think about it as cancer prevention. And that was another area we saw yesterday in one of the presentations. This is the area where Indian country is winning. This is where we're on the right end of the charts is when it comes to vaccination rates. Um, and so we're also seeing this with this vaccine. And so this is one of the bright spots. That's where I wanted to start um, here. Um, if you got a chance to check out the poster sessions, we shared some of the research that we've done um, around this area. And it was, um, I'm gonna try to sum it down into like, just because I wasn't really planning on talking about it, but um, our graphic designer really wanted to see, do we really have to put a feather on everything we do at the American Indian Cancer Foundation to get the attention, right? We need culturally appropriate resources, but geez. And does, Every time we have a person in there, do they have to be in full regalia? Because we don't usually walk around in full regalia. And um, so luckily, the research is, and we're going to publish this, the research is, is that overwhelmingly, um, it doesn't have to be somebody in full regalia. That parents, it, seeing a native child of all shades <laughs> that uh, native children come in, um, is what's important and having a message um, that um, talks to them and that design somewhere on the photo is important, but it does not have to be a child in full regalia. Um, and then I have somebody in full regalia in the next picture. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was, <laughs> and you're gonna see some of them now that I say that. Um, one of our first campaigns we did was at, were, was at some powwows so in full. <laughs> um, we did the signs campaign, and so you'll see these signs, and there will people be people in regalia because they were at a powwow. <laughs> um, but people always ask, what are the leading causes when it comes to cancer? And of course, we know very well what some of the leading health behaviors are and what we do or don't do that either increase or decreases our risk. So a lot of the education that we're doing is really around these topics. But I don't think it's just about this stuff. I think some of this stuff is symptoms of some other stuff that's going on, right? Like um, the reason why we have high tobacco addiction rates in our communities um, isn't just because of tobacco addiction. It has to do with the trauma and the stress of um, historical trauma and stress and the current stresses and racism and everything that Native people face every day. So um, we are going upstream and we're talking about some of these things um, and working on changing, working with lots of partners about how do we move the needle on some of these things. Um, we know that harmful tobacco not only causes lung cancer, but it also causes cancer of many other body parts. And we really need to. I really believe that the harmful use of tobacco today is the biggest health threat facing our people. It not only impacts the smoker themselves, um, but also um, others that have to breathe that smoke. And um, as we've learned more and more about the third hand smoke that we come into contact with, um, where there has been smoking even after some of the cigarettes long gone. Um, but first and foremost, before we talk about anything about tobacco addiction, we talk about our tobacco teachings and how do we protect and promote our traditional tobacco use and the proper use and protocols associated with this use has to be first and foremost, and I believe it's an important part of getting to this, um, being able to address the commercial tobacco, tobacco addiction rates in our community. Um, we also have to recognize that alcohol is another risk factor um, for many of the cancers. It increases risks of cancer of the mouth, throat, esophagus, the larynx, the liver, and the breast. And um, there are some guidelines about um, what that, um, where the increased risks are. And then there was this nice little note about some people believe that um, red wine is cancer reduction, but that hasn't been proven. Um, obesity, of course, is an issue. 
um, and increased risk of cancer, of many different cancers again. And so it's really important that we're talking about eating a healthy diet with fresh local foods, being physically active, and keeping a healthy weight may really help reduce some cancers. And I'm seeing a lot of work happening on this in our communities around reclaiming our food and our traditional ways. We even saw it here. How about that? Those awesome lunch we had yesterday and the um, connection back to our um, really good indigenous foods. Um, we want to pay attention that ultraviolet light is also a risk factor for people that it doesn't get a lot of attention in Indian country because either we're too brown and we don't want to get any more brown <laughs> or we're not brown enough and then we're really trying to get brown and we, well, we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> so um, there are some, there's been some research done in this area about um, young American Indian women um, that are light-skinned really using tanning beds a lot more and having increased risk of cancer because wanting to be more native. And um, so we really need to do some work in this area about um, loving the skin you're in, right? Um, and again, thinking about the areas where we have effective cancer screening, we have um, we know that um, these are the four screenings that we know for sure can um, impact our cancer outcomes, where we can catch cancer early and um, treat it while it's easy, easier. So some of the educational materials that we have developed and that we're um, sharing and that are available to you and your communities, um, there's a um, resource on lung cancer screening. The algorithm about who should get screened and when can be a little complicated. And so we've narrowed it down into this nice little yes, no ch uh, chart. Um, these are available. Um, healthcare providers have been loving them to be able to um, have this conversation in an easy way. Um, also working with some folks around um, just getting people to, what is it? Um, it's been challenging to get people to go in for lung cancer screening, and then what is the access to lung cancer screening in Indian country? Where can we go? Um, how available is it? With our really high smoking rates in the Northern Plains, we really need access to lung cancer screening. We've been advocating really, really hard um, that we don't want to be um, left behind on this one. Um, colon cancer. Um, again, I just started out talking about that. We have some really great resources around that, and I encourage you to um, find them, share them. If you're 45 and older, I encourage you to go and get screened. There are several options, and they're not so bad. They get a lot of bad raps, though, right? And a lot of good jokes that go with it. I won't, I won't tell any of our number two jokes. <laughs> Um, and then we have um, cervical cancer is a new area of our work, and Laura's here in the audience leading this work. Um, this is really exciting. We had our first um, Cervical Cancer Awareness Month with our first PAP chat, <laughs> and we have some clinics now doing PAPI hours, um, which is really kind of fun. Take that and use that. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> um, but we really need to, they've changed the guidelines with um, um, PAP tests. You know, that used to be you go in for your annual and it was just like, you just do this and now it's every three years and it's confusing and people can't remember, well, when did I get it? It was a while ago, you know, I'm probably not due. <laughs> probably not due. And so, um, and with healthcare providers and insurance changing, if you don't have the same provider, if there's that, that continuity, it's really hard to stay on top of this and so, um, but it, as we saw with those rates, it's really important that we're staying on top of our cervical cancer screening and encouraging our young women to do that. And promoting the HPV vaccine as a tool to help our younger relatives. So you can, get, you can still get the HPV vaccine up to age 26, is that right? So it's recommended younger, but if anybody's in the room uh, that's 26 and hasn't uh, done that yet, encourage you. Um, we've also done some campaigns around raising awareness around breast health. 
um, called Indigenous Pink. Some of you may have participated. It's, a, it's become a great social media event in the spring where um, we, have t we see pink everywhere in the month of October, right? It doesn't matter where you go. If you're at um, restaurants, I'll have pink everything. And um, so we decided that we needed to do something to raise awareness in Indian country. And the women have loved indigenous pink. So teams of people dressing up in their pink scrubs and sending in photos. And um, it's just been fun. And the most important thing is, is it's really gotten the attention of people to get in and get screened. Again, we have to pay attention that there are community and system level barriers, and this is where, this is an area, again, these are all areas of potential research. There has not been enough research done in this area. If you're looking to do more research, I highly encourage you to think about doing research on cancer issues in American Indian communities. Um, there are some serious community and system level barriers um, that prevent and, um, um, really make it challenging for people to get screened and we know them all too well when it comes to the underfunding of our tribal health care systems um, again the lack of data of having that data is so important um, the high rates of poverty um, poor access to health care um, lack of culturally competent health care providers and again limited availability of pre prevention programs and the cancer screening and specialist care, and how far do we have to travel to get access to these um, services? Um, and we just, I, we always want to remember that when we look at what impacts our health, it's not just about our health behaviors, they make up about 30%. Um, and it's not just about that clinical care, which is about 10%. Um, and our, the environment we live in, um, another 10% and our genes 10% um, but 40% is really about the social and economic factors of where we live work and play and so really paying attention to um, cancer prevention is all around us it's about the water that we drink it's about um, having safe places to get out and be active to be able to um, have food that feeds and nourishes our bodies um, it's um, about all of these having employment and education and access to those things and not having to face racism on a daily basis. Um, this is an example of the work around healthy eating in our communities. And so again, it's not just about the WIC program or about the commodity program. It's not their fault. <laughs> it's about all of it. It's about all of it, and where can we, where's our role in the community? If we're not the dietitian, then what role can we play in improving healthy eating in our communities? Um, maybe it's about the tribal store and what's the food that's available there, or um, do we have access to a farmer's market, or do we know the farmer, can that farmer down the road, is he interested in selling produce, or is she interested in selling produce? Um, to Native communities and making that more available. Maybe there's people in our community that want to grow more food, and I'm getting the time signs. I'm going to talk really fast now. <laughs> um, and again, oh, let's skip over that. So and a lot of work we're doing is around cancer innovation teams, and it's about um, engaging those systems to um, make sure that a leads to B leads to C, so that when a patient walks through the door and they're eligible for a screening or they're a smoker that might be interested in an intervention to quit, that they're getting those services that they need and all the players are, have the same message in place. So we do these trainings with um, IHS, tribal and urban health systems um, all the time around a number of the different. We've developed provider education tools, um, patient education materials, um, as well um, as stuff that um, is engaging on social media. We have a Facebook group that's about, it's a native support group for people who have recently quit or who th are thinking about quitting and provides information to them and they provide information to each other, which is the beautiful part. So I bet you're all wondering, how can you be a part of this, right? 
Because <laughs> you have all this time. I know, you know what I've learned is if you really want something done, you ask the busiest people. And I know you guys are all the busiest people because you're all the researchers that are doing this hard work. And so how can you help us build stronger communities? Um, because we need everybody. Um, it's about the collaborations and the partnerships. And um, so we talk about how can we support, share, and listen. How can you support, share, and listen in your community? Um, there are lots of opportunities um, to either collaborate, um, share your story in your networks about how you're doing this. We don't have enough talk about cancer and health promotion in our communities. Share how you're doing this um, and your story. And I'm going to do a little plug for Power for Hope in my last 30 seconds. <laughs> Power for Hope is coming up um, May 6th. It is our largest fundraising event, and it is about everybody having a chance to honor the people they love who have experienced cancer. You can reach us through these different channels. I would hope that you would go on your website, or go on our website, sign up for our newsletter, or go like us on Facebook, Twitter, or one of those channels. Um, and we have a special offer when it comes to Powell for Hope. You can sign up an online fundraising page today. And um, if you do that today and stop by our booth to see Delilah or Laura, you'll get, oh, it's upside down, <laughs> a t-shirt. <laughs> and as soon as you raise your first $25, you'll earn another t-shirt that will be mailed with this year's t-shirt. So they're really cool, and it's an easy thing to do to just share on your own social media. And we have some really competitive people in the room that really are hoping that, uh, that you don't do anything but donate to her page. <laughs> so if nothing else, you could go on somebody's page and donate as well. Thank you very much. Sorry to have gone over my time. All right, we have time for just one question. Thank you very much, that was a wonderful presentation. You know, when I was in clinic and I had people who were a little reticent about uh, doing colorectal screening, I'd say, you know, if you had a growth on the end of your nose that looked like a small mushroom and it kept getting bigger month after month and then it started to ulcerate, you'd do something about it. But when it's in your colon and you don't know it, you don't do anything about it. So that's why you need to have your colon looked at. That is great, that is great advice. I forgot another, uh, that reminded me of a clever tool. They, somebody told me we should be promoting the colorectal cancer screening as the new weight loss strategy in Indian country. Because you know you have to do your <laughs> three days of prep. <laughs> and they're like, oh, you're doing it wrong. You guys should be promoting it as a weight loss strategy. <laughs> oh my God. So you might see that coming out next. <laughs>